So I'll be talking about uh, basically a problem from graph drawing. And so, hold on. Uh, so roughly for the past year or so, I've been thinking about the following Ramsey type question, which is that suppose you have a drawing of, let's say the complete graph, KN in the plane, like in this picture here, given any such drawing of KN, can we always find a nice planar subconfiguration inside of the drawing? And here, a nice planar subconfiguration could mean many things. So, for example, maybe you're interested in finding a large uh, plane subgraph or non crossing subgraph, kind of like these red edges here. Or maybe you're interested in finding a plane edge or many plane edges. And here, when I mean by plane, I mean an edge that doesn't cross anybody else like this red edge here. Or perhaps you're interested in finding many pairwise disjoint edges like these three red edges here. Or more generally, maybe you're interested in finding a long non-crossing path like, like these edges here. So to me, these are kind of nice planar subconfigurations. But after you think about this question just for a little bit, you'll quickly realize that you're going to have to add some kind of condition on how you draw the complete graph in the plane because there are many drawings of the complete graph for which none of these nice configurations exist. So for example, you could just place your vertices anywhere, uh, pick any point in the plane, and then draw all of your edges through that point. And then this is a drawing of Kn for which every two edges cross, and so therefore there wouldn't be any nice planar subconfiguration inside. And if you wanted to, you could do something slightly more clever, which is draw the complete graph in this twisted way. And this is what Pock and Toth did back in 2010. And if you draw the complete graph in this twisted way, every pair of edges will cross exactly once or twice. So every pair of edges will cross, and moreover, no two edges will cross more than two times. And so therefore, if you want any hope of guaranteeing to find any nice planar subconfiguration here, you're going to have to have this condition that every pair of edges cross at most once. And graphs drawn in the plane with this property that any two edges have at most one point in common, today these are commonly referred to as simple topological graphs. And so when I say a topological graph, I just mean a graph that's drawn in the plane where the vertices are points and the edges are curves connecting the cor corresponding points. And the simple condition here is this thing, or the simple part here is this lab condition here, which is that every pair of edges have at most one point in common. And so in simple topological graphs, which is the only thing I'll talk about here from now on, uh, every pair of edges looks like one of these three pictures here. So either two edges will have a common endpoint, and that's the only point that they'll have in common, or they'll have a common interior point, which is known as crossing, or they simply won't have any points in common, um, and so they'll be just completely disjoint. And so now given the complete simple topological graph on N vertices, can we always find a nice planar subconfiguration inside of it? So you can find it easily a non large non-crossing subgraph if you're this general, because you can fix any vertex and look at all of the edges emanating out of it. Uh, since they have that fixed vertex point in common, they've already had that one point in common. And so technically they won't cross each other. And so all of the edges emanating out of this fixed vertex uh, creates this planar star, which isn't so interesting. I would say a lot of attention the past uh, couple of years or so was focused on this problem here, finding many pairwise disjoint edges. And I'll say something about that at the very end of my talk. And I'll say something about the more general problem about finding non-crossing uh, paths. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about today in this talk was more of this middle problem here about plane edges and its generalization. Uh, any questions so far? So the earliest paper I could find about plane edges in simple topological graphs was this paper by Ringel from 1963, who was actually interested in the dual version of what I asked. 
and how he was interested in finding drawings with the most plane edges as possible. So he defined capital F of N to be the maximum number of plane edges in a complete n vertex simple topological graph. And just as, a, as an example, if you take, let's say, the complete convex geometric graph, like in this picture here, uh, you'll have n plane edges, which are these outer red edges here. And so he was curious to find more. And what he showed in his 1963 paper is that f of n, big F of n, is 2n minus 2. So you can get an upper bound of 2n minus 2 by essentially double counting. And you can get a lower bound of 2n minus 2 by taking the following drawing, which is taking n minus 1 points, let's say, in convex position. And then you have these n minus 1 edges here. And then you have this internal vertex as the last vertex. And then you have, again, another n minus 1 edges here. And then the only edges left to draw are the edges connecting two vertices on the outer wheel here. And if you just draw it outside of the wheel, like out here, then all of these 2n minus 2 edges will stay plain. And so this would be the construction that matches the 2n minus 2 bound. <clears throat> OK, so kind of motivated by this 1963 paper, Harberth and Mangerson uh, basically studied the question that I asked earlier. So they defined little f of n to be the minimum number of plane edges in an n-vertex simple topological graph. And what they proved in the 70s were these as exact values for little f of n. So in particular, they showed that no matter how you draw k7 in the plane in a simple way, there's always going to be two plane edges. And what they proved for n is at least 8 is that this is 0. So they proved that you're not always guaranteed to have plane edges in complete simple topological graphs. And moreover, what they showed roughly 20 years later is that not only are you not guaranteed plane edges, but there are drawings of the complete n vertex simple topological graph in which every edge crosses at least a linear number of other edges. And so it's well known if you have the complete n vertex simple topological graph, on average, each edge will cross on the order of n squared other edges. And it was widely believed at the time that even though on average, each edge crosses n squared other edges, you should be able to find a special edge somewhere that crosses far fewer edges. And so this conjecture was kind of more formalized in this book by Brass, Moser, and Pock from 2005. So they defined H of n to be the minimum integer such that every complete n vertex simple topological graph has some special edge that crosses at most H of n other edges. And what they conjectured is that you should be able to find a special edge somewhere that crosses far less than average, uh, more exactly little o n squared other edges. And this is where I kind of came up with this informal definition of short, which is in my title. I just kind of informally call in it short if it crosses little o n squared other edges in the drawing. So basically, Brass, Moser, and Pock conjecture that short edges always exist in complete and vertex simple topological graphs. So uh, this conjecture was settled uh, shortly afterwards in 2009 by Kinchel and Baltar. So they proved that short edges do indeed exist. So they were able to get a polylog factor improvement over the trivial upper bound. So they can always find an edge that crosses at most this many other edges. And moreover, they came up with two constructions that show that uh, H of n is at least n to the 3 halves. So they came up with two, two drawings of Kn such that each edge crosses at least n to the 3 halves other edges, which is better than the thing I said about Mangerson and Harbor earlier. 
So the, the result from the 70s was that H of n was at least linear, and so they improved it to n to the three halves. Um, just a quick comment. So this phenomenon of short edges existing in complete simple topological graphs, it's not just a density thing that's going on. So it's not, it's, it's almost kind of essential that we're dealing with a complete simple topological graph. So what I'm saying is just because you have a dense simple topological graph with many edges, again, on average, each edge will cross n squared other edges, but it's not true that you'll find a special edge. So there's many such constructions, but for example, if you just take two complete bipartite graphs, such that all of the edges in one bipartite graph crosses all of these other edges, then there wouldn't be any short edges. So it is kind of essential that uh, it is complete. So it's not just a density thing going on here. Okay. So what I wanted to, I guess, talk about here is basically uh, I was able to give a polynomial improvement to this upper bound. And so the thing that I plan on talking about here today is this new result, which is that H of n is at most n to the seven fourths. So in other words, in every complete n vertex simple topological graph, there is some special edge somewhere that crosses at most uh, this many other edges. And so assuming you believe me, assuming that this is true, uh, that means that the best known upper and lower bounds for H of n is somewhere between n to the three halves and n to the seven fourths. Conjecture? So I wrote this conjecture in, in the paper. Uh, so technically, Kitchell and Baltar didn't make this conjecture. They said something like it could be true that it's on the order of n to the three halves. Um, but I kind of reiterated the conjecture that it's, it's probably going to be closer to the lower bound. Um, the reason why I say that is because when I go through kind of the rough idea of the proof, um, one of the main ideas is to use tools and techniques from VC dimension theory. And it's quite believable that this is a bit of an overkill. So these tools and techniques from VC dimension theory are a bit uh, heavy and maybe one could come up with a more topological argument to get n to the three halves, but I, I wasn't able to do so. So, so, but it's quite plausible that these ideas that I'm going to show you, it's a bit of an overkill. Okay, any questions about the statement? So what I'll do next for the rest of the talk is essentially sketch the proof of this n to the seventh force. Okay, so uh, one of the key tools that I use is this uh, kind of well-known matching lemma due to Chazelle Volt. So it's actually a variant of it on set systems with bounded DC dimension. And so I'll briefly go over what I mean about set systems and DC dimension. So suppose we have a set system F on a ground set V, where the size of the ground set is this little n here. Then we say that a subset S of your vertices, maybe these vertices here, uh, is shattered by your set system F if for every subset of S, you can find a set A that contains exactly those members uh, from S. So for example, these three vertices here is shattered by F if I have eight sets, one of which that doesn't contain any of the three vertices. And then I have three sets that contains exactly one of those vertices, two sets that contains exactly two, and then I have the eight set that contains all three. And so if I have all of these eight sets, then we say that this subset is shattered by my family. And so the VC dimension of a set system is simply the size of the largest subset of vertices that can be shattered uh, by your family. And so in general, I'll be talking about uh, set systems with bounded VC dimension. But actually, it turns out that you don't really want to look at the VC dimension. 
Uh, what's more useful is to look at the dual VC dimension, um, which is the VC dimension of the dual set system of F. But actually, what's really important is to just look at what's called the dual shatter function of F, which I'll now define. So this is basically the main parameter that's that's important. So the dual VC dimension, sorry, the dual shatter function of your set system F is this kind of funny thing here, this pi star F of M. So it's defined to be the maximum number of equivalence classes on uh, your vertex set defined by any M set in the map. So for example, if this is your set system down here and these dots are your ground set, then if you look at any M sets in your family, then these M sets are going to partition uh, the vertex set into these equivalence classes where two vertices are going to be equivalent if they lie exactly in the same sets among A1 through AM. So for example, these are my sets then these three vertices here would be one equivalence class. Uh, these two vertices here would be another equivalence class and et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically the cells of the Venn diagram among M sets. And so the maximum number of cells you get among any M sets, that's precisely the dual shatter function of that. And so as you can see, if you have geometry, you'll have a very nice dual shatter function because if this is really my set system, meaning points in the plane, and my sets are these rectangular boxes, then if I look at any M sets, that would correspond to M boxes. And M of these boxes will partition the plane into M squared regions. And so that's very nice. It's very well behaved. And so that's basically what we'll focus on. We'll focus on now set systems with well-behaved dual shatter functions. And what I mean by well-behaved, I mean that it's, it grows polynomially in M. Uh, roughly speaking, this D here is basically the dual VC dimension. And the dual VC dimension is closely related to VC dimension. Not exactly the same, but they're, you know, if one's bounded, the other one's bounded. Okay, any questions? Okay, so suppose we have this set system with a nice dual shatter function. Then there's this uh, important notion called stabbing. So we say that a pair of vertices in your ground set is, so a set A stabs a pair of vertices if it contains exactly one of the two vertices. So the pair X and Y here is stabbed by A because A contains Y, but it doesn't contain X. Uh, this example here, A contains neither, so it doesn't stab the pair X and Y. Here, A contains both vertices, so it doesn't stab X or Y, the pair XY, but a set like this would stab the pair XY. <clears throat> Okay, and so one of the famous theorems due to Chazelle and Wetzel on set systems with well-behaved dual shatter functions is this, uh, it's also called the short edge lemma. So it says the following. So again, suppose you have a set system and the dual shatter function is well-behaved. Then somewhere in your ground set, there's gonna be two vertices, let's say X and Y such that that pair of vertices is going to be stabbed by very few members from your set system. So the number of sets from F that stabs that special pair X and Y is going to be at most this quantity here. And what you can do once you have the short edge lemma, you can apply a roughly standard reweighting technique and get this Famous result due to Chazelle and Welzel on matchings with low stabbing number, which says that, again, if you have a set system F with a well-behaved dual shatter function, then you can actually find a perfect matching on the ground set. So let's just assume N is even. You can find a perfect matching on the ground set such that if you fix any set in your set system, 
it will stab very few members in the matching. So it's a perfect matching. So the size of the matching is linear in N and each set will stab just N to the one minus one over D members in the matching. <clears throat> So what I thought was interesting is you can play with these proofs and actually get both the short edge lemma and this matching result at the same time, which probably isn't so surprising, but this is basically what I needed for my application in track drawing. So what you can do is uh, get this matching result, which is the matching re result that I'll need uh, for my application. So again, it's about set systems with nice dual shatter functions. And what it says is that you can throw away a small set of vertices X. So there's some trash set you could throw away. And the size of this trash set will be little o n basically, it'll be small. Such that on the remaining vertices, you'll have a perfect matching. Such that for each matching, very few sets will stab it. So for each matching and the perfect matching, at most this many sets will stab it. And moreover, if I fix any sets, very few members in the matching will stab that as well. So you have kind of both. Okay, so any questions about this result? It's basically both the short edge lemma and matching result at the same. So this is kind of the main combinatorial tool that we'll use to uh, find this short edge in simple topological graphs. Okay. So, uh, so back to the original statement. So remember, we're interested in graphs drawn in the plane. So suppose we have a complete graph on n vertices drawn in the plane somewhere. And so we want to find some special edge that crosses very few other edges. And what we'll do first is we'll fix a vertex called V naught in the drawing and look at all of the edges that emanate out of V naught. And uh, because of the simple condition, it will be a planar star. And so that means that I have this kind of nice radial ordering of the vertices. So I just start at any vertex, let's say V1, and then as the edges emanate out of V naughts, I just radially order the rest of the vertices, V1, V2, and et cetera, et cetera. And so I want to eventually use that matching result. Um, and so I'm going to have to define a set system. And so I'll define the following set system. So the ground set will be these vertices up here. And then I'll define the set system F with these sets Tij, where Tij will be, um, it will be the set of vertices that lie inside of the triangle V naught, V i, and V j. So for example, if I want to look at the set T in four, I look at B, oops, oops. I look at B naught, B three, and B four. So I look at the triangle B naught, B three, and B four. Um, notice that the triangle is a simple closed curve because any two edges will have an endpoint in common, so their interiors won't cross. So any triangle will, will actually be a simple closed curve in the plane, and then whatever vertices lie inside of the simple closed curve. Um, that's precisely the set T34. So T kind of stands for triangle, and uh, you know, three, four are the, the indices of the, the endpoints. Okay, and so I do this for each pair. And then I just collect all of these sets, and then this is my set system F. So in particular, this set system as on the order of n squared sets, possibly with repetition. And it's a nice set system. So its dual shatter function is very well behaved. Because if I look at any m sets from 
my set system, that corresponds to M of these triangles here. And because of the simple condition, any two triangles, their boundaries here, will cross at most a constant number of times. And so therefore, any M triangles will partition the plane up into at most M squared regions. And you could just show this by induction because of the, the simple condition. And so therefore, uh, the dual shatter function for this set system is just on the order of M squared. Okay, so because I have this nice set system, I can apply that matching result that I mentioned earlier, the variant of Fizel and Wilson's matching result. And after I apply that matching results, when I run through the numbers, I'll throw away roughly n set and three fourths vertices in the ground set. So I'll throw away very few vertices. And then on the remaining vertices, there will be a perfect matching, which is, I guess, pictured by these purple matchings, such that for each matching pair, the number of sets from my set system that stabs any purple matching will be on the order of n to the seven fourths. And moreover, if I fix any sets from the set system, it will be stabbed by very few members in the matching. So remember, I only threw away n to the three fourths vertices. So I still have roughly n matching on the order of n matching pairs. And so each set stabs just square root of them basically. So very few. Okay. So now among these purple matchings, I'll pick the one which is called, let's say, VXBY, such that if I look at the triangle V naught VXBY, again, it makes this nice closed curve, that triangle V naught VXBY. And then I pick VXBY because it has the fewest number of purple matchings that lie completely inside of this triangle. So if I look at all of the triangles generated by V naught and a purple matching, I pick the one with the fewest number of purple matchings inside of the triangle. Okay, so some matchings will lie completely inside, some matchings will lie completely outside, some matchings will have one endpoint inside, one endpoint outside. But remember, this will happen very few times because that would stab the, this set here. So how do you count those inside? Because some of them are like half inside. Yeah, so you don't. So I so I pick the triangle, this one, whose triangle has the minimum number of both endpoints, purple matching completely inside. Also the edge. This edge can go in and out. No, no, I so said I'm not looking at it. So when I say matching, I'm just combinatorial matching, see, not, not the topological edge. Uh yeah. So these matchings just, yeah, just both endpoints when I leave my match. Any other questions? I feel like I'm going really fast. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, okay, the XVY is the one with the fewest number of purple matchings lying inside. And so now the claim is that this is the edge that I'm looking for. So this red edge VX, VY, this is the edge that supposedly crosses very few other edges. And so we'll show this by essentially counting it out. Uh, I will be a little uh, hand wavy because some of the arguments are a bit topological, but hopefully you'll get the intuition that this edge crosses very few other edges. Oh, okay, so one thing I, I'm going to have to cheat, which is something you can easily get from that matching lemma, which is that the distance between VX and VY is also going to be very short. So remember, there was this radial ordering of the vertices. And so any two vertices has a distance between them. 
And so what I'm saying is that the distance between actually any matching, but in particular Vx, Vy, the distance in that radial ordering will just be on the order of n to the three fourths. Okay, so. <laughs> So oh, my monitor is fine. Uh, no, no, it's interesting. <laughs> was hinting that you're going too fast. <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to slow down. Okay, so let's count the possible edges that crosses this red edge. So there's E naught, which are the edges incident to V naught, which is clearly not many. So even if all of the edges incident to V naught crosses the red edge, that's not a problem. There are the edges with one endpoint in the trash set, X. Uh, but remember, the trash set is small, so the number of edges with an endpoint in the trash set will be um, small, so at most n to the 7 fourths, because the trash set has size at most n to the 3 fourths. So even if all of those edges crosses the red edge, that's also not a problem. Then there are edges with an endpoint between Vx, Vy in that radial ordering. And so this is where I cheated, that um, the distance between Vx and Vy is small, so there's not that many vertices between Vx and Vy. And so even if all of these edges cross as the red edge, that's also, there's not that many of them, so that's also not something to worry about. So uh, let's look at the rest of the edges that don't belong into one of these three categories which are edges with an endpoint before Vx or after Vy, and it's not in this trash set here. So kind of like this example, this, this picture here, or maybe this picture here. Okay, so among these edges, um, we make this following observation, which is that among these edges, if both endpoints are outside of that triangle TXY, this triangle here, this thin, thin, thinner one, if both endpoints are outside or if both endpoints are inside, and if that black edge crosses this red edge, then the corresponding set of TIJ, if this is I and J, that set will stab this matching pair of Vx, Vy, this purple matching here. And the reason why it'll stab the pair of Vx, Vy is because if it crosses this red edge, then if both endpoints are outside, it must cross exactly one of these two sides, but it can't cross both. Because since both endpoints are outside, if it crosses the red edge and then it crosses one side, it can't come back in because of the simple condition, it'll be trapped. And so therefore, Vx, Vy within this thinner triangle is separated by this black edge. And on one side of the black edge, we know is outside of the triangle. And on the other side of the black edge is inside of the triangle. And so that means that that bigger triangle must contain exactly one of the two vertices. And so that means that that set would stab the pair Vx, Vy. And we know, and it's the same argument if both endpoints are inside. And since we know that purple matching has very few sets that stabs it from the matching lemma, we know that, which I call E3, uh, the number of edges with both endpoints outside or both endpoints inside that crosses the red edge, uh, the number of these such edges must be small because they give rise to sets that stabs that matching pair of Vx, Vy. So this is, I guess, the main part where I use the, the matching lemma. Hmm. 
<laughs> I think there's a loose connection because when I tap it, I'll try to tap it softly. So that means that among these edges that could possibly cross the red edge, there's not that many. And so the only edges that are left are edges. There we go. Edges with one endpoint inside of the triangle and one endpoint outside of the triangle. And the endpoints are either before Vx or after Vy. So like in this example here, an edge like this could still cross this red edge. And, you know, I guess potentially without any argument, there could be many such edges that crosses the red edge. And so this is where I'll kind of uh, hand wave. Um, and this is the part where the minimality comes in. So the goal is to show that the number of such edges with one endpoint inside of the triangle and one endpoint outside of the triangle and crosses the red edge, the number of these edges is small. And so for sake of contradiction, suppose there's many such edges. Suppose there's um, more than n to the seven fourths such edges, where the c here is a, a large constant. Well, that means there must be many vertices inside of the triangle. So there must be many edges that emanate out of the knots, crosses this red edge, and then has an endpoint uh, inside of the triangle. And the number of such endpoints should be at least n to the three fourths. Because if there's at least n to the seven fourths such crossings, there needs to be at least n to the three fourths such vertices inside. Because, you know, other, there's no other way to get n to the seven fourths. And so we then look at these vertices inside. And remember, these vertices, there's a perfect matching among it and the rest of the vertices. So among these vertices, they participate in that perfect matching somehow. Some of them participate in the perfect matching with its other member outside of the triangle. But again, by the matching results, very few would do that. So by the matching results, at most half of, you know, if C is big enough, at most half of those vertices will participate in the matching with the other endpoint outside of it. Which means that uh, for at least, you know, on the order of n to the three fourths, many of the matchings will lie completely inside of this triangle. So this triangle, TXY, will actually contain many purple matches. And not only are they purple matchings, but remember there was an edge that emanated out of the knots before Vx or after Vy crosses the red edge and then enters uh, enters inside of the triangle at these endpoints. And then you can argue that the topological edge will lie completely inside of this of this triangle. So now you look at the topological edge between the between that matching pair. And what basically happens is that this happens many times, like on the order of n to the three fourths. And then, so here's well, kind of hand wave, but the punchline is that if this happens on the order of n to the three fourths times, you can find a thinner triangle like this one here that contains fewer members from the matching. And that will contradict the minimality of Tx and Ty. So that's where we get the contradiction. And this is where we show that these final set of edges is at most n to the set force. Wait, so why does the division of the inside? So, so that's because it can go in and out somehow. Yeah, so um, remember they have endpoints that already, its endpoints are already intersecting these. Yes, yes, but there are some cases that is it immediate. Well, in this picture, it's pretty immediate. Yes, but in the other picture, you know what can be. I think so. Yeah. Okay. 
I can't. <laughs> yeah, I can't think either. <laughs> um, I just... Yeah, and that heart shaped picture, I think so. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so then we just count it out. And then since each possible edge that crosses a red edge is on the order of n to the seven fourths, and so therefore that red edge, that minimality property is the, the special edge that crosses very few other edges. <clears throat> Okay, so these are my last two slides. Uh, it's the usual kind of open problems uh, slides. Um, so the first one is about the problem that I just talked about, about finding short edges. Um, honestly, my main motivation was to just get the polynomial improvements, um, but it would be nice to actually, I guess, determine the exact constants in the exponents and. As I mentioned earlier, it'd be nice to um, either prove or disprove the conjecture that's on the order of n to the three halves. And like I said earlier, I think these tools and techniques that I just talked about, I think they're a bit of an overkill, but uh, it was the only thing I knew how to do. Um, actually, I have two more slides, I guess. Uh, so two, so the, Earlier, nice planar uh, subconfigurations um, I was talking about. Um, maybe the more pop most popular one is finding many pairwise disjoint edges, and the best results in this direction is due to Eichholzer and company, which says that it, every complete n vertex simple topological graph contains roughly square root n number of pairwise disjoint edges. Um, it's not known whether or not the answer to this is linear or not. So it's not known if, if you can approve this to be linear. And there's actually a crazy conjecture from 88 that says that supposedly you should find a non-crossing Hamiltonian cycle. So that would be roughly n over two, um, but it's not even known whether or not this conjecture is false either. But one thing about this problem is that it could just be a density thing that's going on here. So it is possible that if you just have a dense, simple topological graph, you could find many pairwise disjoint edges, um, but it's not known whether or not um, it's really just a density thing going on here. Um, for a while, it wasn't known if you can find a long non-crossing path. Um, it, it was known that you can find a polynomial size um, set of pairwise disjoint edges, but whether or not you can connect these disjoint edges and make a long non-crossing path was open for, for a while. And uh, kind of using simple counting arguments, no heavy tools, I was able to show that you could find a polynomial size non-crossing path in a complete n vertex simple topological graph. Uh, but again, it could just be a density thing. So the proof doesn't generalize to dense simple topological graphs. And it's possible that there's just some, simply a density thing going on here. But um, it's not known whether or not you can find a polynomial sized path, non crossing path, in dense simple topological graphs. Um, and if you like this problems about polynomial to logarithmic transitions, um, so it's not known whether or not in the complete and vertex simple topological graph, if you can find a non-crossing cycle. So we can find a long non-crossing path, but to close it, um, it's, it's not clear if there's a polynomial size uh, such cycle, which I think is, is interesting. Okay, so that's, that's it.